Welcome back to this introductory statistics course. Today we'll be talking about the sampling distribution. I've previously explained the concept of sampling theory. We assume that there exists a population which constitutes all of the individuals that could have been part of our sample. All of these individuals have a particular trait, variable x, and we could compute descriptive statistics for variable x in the population. For example, the population mean, mu, would give us the average value of variable x, and a population standard deviation, sigma, would give us the average distance from the mean for all individuals in the population. But in practice, we don't have access to the population, so we draw a sample. And we can compute many of the same descriptive statistics within the sample. And then we could use those sample descriptive statistics as estimators of their population equivalent. And today we're going to be talking about a measure of uncertainty that tells us how accurate are the sample statistics as estimators of the population parameter. Let's talk about the process of estimating population parameters. Let's say we want to estimate the population mean mu. All we have access to, however, is a sample. So we calculate the sample mean m, sometimes also indicated as x bar. But this sample mean is not a perfect estimate of the population mean mu. There's a difference between them. And we call this unknown difference between mu and the estimator of mu, m, the sampling error. How wrong is the sample statistic m as an estimator of mu? We could do a thought experiment and imagine that we could draw many samples from the same population. In each of those samples, we could calculate the sample mean m. And if we drew a distribution of all of those sample means, we could call it the sampling distribution. It's a hypothetical distribution of the statistics we would calculate in many samples. And now I want to introduce you to a fundamental concept in statistics that allows us to perform inference on population parameters. And that is central limit theorem because central limit theorem proves that as the number of hypothetical samples that we could draw increases, this sampling distribution starts to resemble a normal distribution. And the location of that normal distribution, so the value of its mean, converges to the true population mean. And the standard deviation of that sampling distribution tells us how wrong, on average, our sample means are as an estimate of the population mean. Because remember that the standard deviation of a normal distribution tells us the average distance from the mean. And in this case, that distance from the mean is the sampling error. So the standard deviation of the sampling distribution tells us the average sampling error of sample means relative to the true population mean. There's really only one condition that needs to be met in order for this to be true. And that is that the samples we draw are sufficiently large. So what is sufficiently large? Well, let's say they have to be bigger than 30 observations. But one really fascinating insight is that this sampling distribution emerges regardless of the shape of the original distribution of the data. So this applies regardless of whether the variable is normally distributed in a population or uniformly distributed or has any other distributional shape. So here we see a demonstration of the sampling distribution. We see three distributions. The first distribution is the unobserved distribution of values in the population. So these are the values of all of the elements of our population. If we draw one sample from this population, the values are distributed as shown here in a histogram. And finally, if we were to draw many similar samples from the population, and calculate that the mean in each of those samples, then those means would also follow a normal distribution, which looks like this. So let's say we're drawing from a population normal distribution, samples with a size of 30 participants, and we draw just one sample at a time. So here you see the distribution of values in that one sample, and here you see the mean of that one sample, and it is just a little bit lower than the true population mean of zero. Now let's draw another sample. Its mean is a little higher than the true population mean of zero. Now let's draw one more, 
This one again is a little bit lower. And one more. This one is very close to the population mean. And we can keep sampling and sampling and sampling. And the more we keep drawing samples, the more the distribution of those sample means begins to resemble a normal distribution. Until we draw, let's say, 200 samples, and it really closely resembles a normal distribution. And if we drew 1,000, it would be even more similar to a normal distribution. But now comes the interesting thing. If our population distribution is uniform, so every value occurs equally often, then our sample also looks pretty uniform. But again, our sampling distribution is normal. So this is what central limit theorem tells us. No matter the shape of the distribution in the population, the distribution of sample statistics will be normal. And one final example, just to really drive this home. This is a log normal population distribution. So if we draw one sample, we're also going to see that low values are much more common than high values. But again, if we draw the distribution of sample means, that looks pretty normal. The more samples we draw, the more normal it looks. And the larger the samples that we draw, the more normal it looks. Now let me introduce you to a very important concept, the standard error. I talked to you about the standard deviation of this hypothetical sampling distribution. And that standard deviation is so important that we've given it its own unique name to prevent confusion with the normal standard deviation. We call it the standard error. So the standard error is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of a statistic. And with this in mind, we can say that the sampling distribution is normally distributed with mean equal to the population mean mu and standard deviation equal to the standard error of the mean. The standard error gives us the average sampling error. So when we use m to estimate mu, the standard error tells us how wrong we are on average. If the standard error is very small, then our guesses about mu based on the sample mean m are very accurate. And if our standard error is very large, then our guesses are very poor. We can calculate the standard error by taking the population standard deviation sigma and dividing it by the square root of our sample size. So the standard error has two ingredients, the population standard deviation and the sample size. How do these two ingredients influence the size of the standard error? First of all, the standard error decreases as our sample size increases. A larger sample gives us more precise estimates of the population mean mu. In fact, all sample statistics become better estimators of the population parameter as our sample size increases. And it's easy to understand why this is, because you can do a thought experiment where you increase the sample size until it's so large that you've included the entire population. At this point, any sample statistic is equal to the population parameter with no sampling error. So by extension of this argument, you can see that the larger our sample gets, the more accurate our guesstimates of population parameters are going to be. So as the sample size increases, the standard error decreases, and if the sample becomes big enough, the standard error goes towards zero. The standard error also decreases if the population standard deviation decreases. And here's another thought experiment to understand why this is the case. Imagine that every person in the population has the exact same value. In other words, the standard deviation is zero. In this case, our sample mu in this case, our sample mean will be a perfect estimate of the population mean because everybody has the same value. So by extension, it stands to reason that as the population standard deviation decreases, the standard error also decreases. And if the population standard deviation will be zero, then the standard error would also be zero. And our sample means would be a perfect estimator of the population mean. So I've been talking about using the sample mean to estimate the population mean. But the same principles here apply to any other statistic that you could calculate. They each have their own standard error. And in this course, you learn how to calculate the standard error for the mean by hand. The standard errors for other statistics can be a little bit more complicated to calculate. And that's why you will use statistical software to estimate those. The key takeaways are the following. 
You can use sample statistics to estimate population parameters. Sample statistics are not perfect estimators, they're always a little bit wrong. If we could take many samples from the population and we could plot the distribution of sample statistics, we would always get a normal distribution according to central limit theorem. And the standard deviation of that normal distribution tells us how wrong we are on average when we estimate the population parameter. That standard error is a measure of uncertainty about using our sample statistic as estimate of the population parameter. And we can use that measure of uncertainty for different purposes, including statistical testing. Let's see if you understand the intuitions behind the standard error. Imagine there are two elevators. One has a limit of six people and the other has a limit of 12 people. Both of these elevators get stuck if the average weight of passengers exceeds 95 kilograms. Which of these two elevators will get stuck more often than the other? The elevator for six people will get stuck more often because it is a smaller sample, so we're more likely to observe extreme values because the standard error is larger. And once we hit an extreme value that exceeds an average of 95 kilos per passenger, then the elevator will get stuck. Here is a second thought experiment to see if you understand the standard error. It has been observed that the best schools are often smaller schools. So does that mean that small scale education is better? This is a charged question for an audience of liberal arts students. Think about it for a second. We can find an alternative explanation for this observation in the formula for the standard error. Because again, smaller samples, so smaller schools, will be more variable because they have a larger standard error. So among small schools, there are more likely to be very good schools, but also more likely to be very bad schools. There's one remaining problem that I've ignored until now, and that is that we often don't know what the population standard deviation is. And there's a very simple solution. We just replace the population standard deviation with the sample standard deviation. Now let's look at some of the things that we can do with the standard error. Well, one thing you can do is to use the normal distribution and perform probability calculus, as we did last week. Last week we used probability calculus to estimate, for example, how likely it is to observe basketball players taller than 212 centimeters. This week we're going to use probability calculus to estimate how likely it is to observe a mean greater than a particular value. Thanks to central limit theorem, we can use the normal distribution to make inferences about population parameters using only sample statistics and you use the properties of the normal distribution to calculate all kinds of probabilities. So I want to briefly disambiguate the three different uses of the normal distribution that we've discussed today. First of all, we've talked about a variable being normally distributed in a population. This is called the population distribution, and it has a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. This distribution is typically unknown, or we also say it's unobserved. The second use of the normal distribution is to describe the distribution of data in a sample. This distribution has mean m and standard deviation s, or sd, and this distribution is typically observed. And the third use of the normal distribution has been as a sampling distribution. It describes the distribution of many statistics calculated in hypothetical samples from the population. This distribution also has mean mu and its standard deviation is the standard error. This is a theoretical distribution, so we know its theoretical properties and we estimate its parameters based on the sample, but we don't typically observe the sampling distribution. So one way to use the standard error is to express our uncertainty about the sample statistic as estimator of the population parameter. And this procedure is called a confidence interval. A very simple intuition to understand what a confidence interval is, is imagine that we calculate the average height of people in a sample, and it's 172 centimeters. How confident are we in 172 as an estimate of the population? Well, we could draw some windows around this value that tell us, well, the population value is unlikely to be much smaller than this, and unlikely to be much higher than this. Those two windows, the lower bound and the upper bound, are 
a confidence interval. And we use a standard error to calculate it because the standard error is our measure of uncertainty about the statistic as an estimate of the population parameter. Remember that if the standard error is very small, then our guesses are very accurate, so this window is going to be very narrow. And if our standard error is large, then our guesses are going to be very imprecise, so this window is going to be very large too. And we use probability calculus to decide exactly how wide this window should be. Remember, for example, that 95% of a sample is between plus and minus two standard deviations. This is a very common probability to use for a confidence interval. So most often we report 95% confidence intervals, and then we say that this is an interval that contains the population parameter with 95% probability. And remember that we're talking about long run probability. So if we would draw 100 samples from the population and calculate 100 95% confidence intervals in those 100 samples, 95% of them would contain the population value. Of course, we never know for one specific confidence interval whether it includes the population parameter, right? So when we say 95% confidence, we are talking about confidence in the procedure. 95% of the time, this procedure will give us an interval that contains the population value. In one specific instance, we don't have a clue. So how do you calculate the lower and the upper bound of a 95% confidence interval? Well, we just take the mean in the middle and we subtract minus two times the standard error. And to get the upper bound, we add plus two times the standard error. Where does this number two come from? Well, plus and minus two standard deviations contains 95% probability. That's where the two comes from. So if we wanted to get a 68% confidence interval, we would just take the mean plus and minus one standard error. And if we wanted a 99% confidence interval, we would take the mean plus and minus three times the standard error using the default probabilities of plus one standard deviation, plus two standard deviations, and plus three standard deviations. So this is an application that illustrates the fact that this 95% confidence talks about the properties of the procedure, not of any one individual confidence interval. This app draws random samples from the population, and in each sample it estimates the population mean. Those are the blue dots. For each sample, it also calculates a 95% confidence interval. Those are the black whiskers around the blue dot. And what we see is that most of these black whiskers, these confidence intervals, do include the population mean of zero, which is indicated by the red dotted line here. But some of them, like this one with the red whiskers, coincidentally exclude the population mean. So what we see is that in the long run, 95% of the confidence intervals estimated this way will contain the population mean and 5% of them will not contain the population mean. So if we keep this app running, ultimately this number will go towards 95%. We can also use the standard error to calculate z-scores. So in the previous lecture, we discussed how you can calculate z-scores for the population and sample distribution. For example, we discussed how IQ is normally distributed with a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 15. And that allows us to calculate the probability that the IQ of a randomly chosen person exceeds 115. To do this, we calculated the z-score. And the z-score is calculated as the value x, in this case 115, minus the mean mu divided by the standard deviation. So in this case, that's 115 minus 100 is 15, divided by 15. So we get a z-score of 1. And that's correct, because the z-score tells us how many standard deviations this value is above the mean. So a value of 115 is one standard deviation above the mean. And then we can look up in a table or calculate in a spreadsheet the probability of observing a z-score greater than 1. And that probability is 0.025, or 
Now today we're going to use the same probability calculus and apply it to the sampling distribution of the mean. And this allows us to answer questions such as what is the probability that the mean of a random sample of 9 people exceeds 115? To answer this question, first we have to calculate the standard error of the mean. Remember that that is sigma divided by the square root of n. So sigma, the standard deviation, is 15. Sample size n is 9, and the square root of 9 is 3. So we get 15 divided by 3 is 5. And then we can use the z-score again. So in this case, we take 115 minus 100 is 15, divided by 5 gives us 3. And then we can calculate the probability of observing a z-score greater than 3, and that probability is 0 0.001. So the probability that the mean of a random sample of 9 people exceeds 115 is just one-tenth of a percent. Here's another example. Let's assume that weekly fruit consumption is distributed normally with a mean of 10.5 and a standard deviation of 6.4. What is the probability that the mean fruit consumption of 16 randomly chosen people is less than 7.78? Well, again, first we have to calculate the standard error because this is about the sample means. So we divide the standard deviation of 6.4 by the square root of the sample size and the square root of 16 is 4. So 6.4 divided by 4 is 1.6. And then we can calculate the z-score. So we take the value x, which in this case is 7.78, minus the mean 10.5, and we divide this by 1.6. And we get a z-score of minus 1.7. So now what we need is the left tail probability to the left of minus 1.7. And we can look this up in a table or use a spreadsheet to calculate it. And what we observe is that that probability is 0 0.04. So there's a 4% chance of observing a sample with a mean smaller than 7.78. As a final example, dear to my heart, a coffee roaster uses a machine to fill 1,000 bags with coffee. The machine's accuracy is standard deviation of 10 grams. For how many grams should this roaster set the machine to ensure that at most one bag out of a thousand contains less than 250 grams? Again, first we have to calculate the standard error. The standard deviation was 10 and we divide that by the square root of a thousand and obtain 0.32. So this is the standard error. Then we want to find the z-score for a probability smaller than 0.001, which is 1 in 1000. And that z-score is 2.33. So this is the z-score that matches a right tail probability of 0.001. Then we can reverse the math of the z-calculation to get an x-score. So we take the mean plus 2.33 times the standard error and we obtain 250.75. So in order to have at most one bag contain less than the nominal amount of 250 grams of coffee, this roaster needs to add three quarters of a gram extra to every bag. That concludes our lesson for today. Good luck with your lab exercises.